notice yafton. And know yourself or know yourself in philosophy. It can apply here as well. Knowledge allows for le the leveling of differences between stakeholders and contribute to creating the appropriate space for dialogue. Knowledge bears truth. Truth bears trust. Trust and knowledge increase the possibility of agreement. Agreement, knowledge, and trust allow for cooperation. Cooperation allows for joint projects. Joint projects lead to generating different kinds of benefits for all. Benefits for all constitute a durable, sustainable outcome. The above points are not rocket science, but they are totally consistent with not only such policies as those promoted by the four pillars of the Canadian government corporate social responsibility policy of March 2009, all of them devoted in one way or another to gathering and sharing knowledge, but also with such multi-stakeholder elaborated framework as the World Economic Forum, six pillars or six challenges for responsible mineral development, which came almost two years after I articulated my proposed model. Both are in almost perfect symbiosis. While my model is articulated around values, as was mentioned previously, Theirs is framed as a series of objectives and challenges which constitute the building blocks of an approach to responsible in investment. I think it is important to mention here those six pillars which resulted from a report on responsible mining development made to the World Economic Forum Responsible Mining Initiative of January 2012 as a result, and I underline uh, this part of my phrase as a result of multi-stakeholder uh, multi process. One, a shared understanding of the cost and benefits. Oh, it's my time up. <laughs> Two, collaborative processes for stakeholder engagement. Three, transparent processes and arrangements. Four, progressive capacity building and knowledge sharing. Five, Thorough compliance monitoring and enforcements of commitment. Let me repeat that one. Thorough compliance monitoring and enforcement of commitments. And last but not least, early and comprehensive dispute management. Canada's systematic involvement in so-called corporate social responsibility issues dates back to the late 80s and early 90s when our mining industry had started to expand into indigenous lands in Canada. In other words, the industry was facing new and socially complex challenges where constitutional issues and treaty rights held by our Amerindian, Amerindian friends and neighbors came in conflict with the traditional, more linear and straightforward ways of yesteryear's mining. The legitimate need and developmental ambition of the indigenous communities and the interests of one of our main Canadian industrial sectors were now unavoidably crossing path and oftentimes conflicting. A new paradigm was needed and was defined as a result of the three categories, uh, as a result of the participation of the three categories of families of stakeholders earlier mentioned, recognizing that they should sit at the same table and work together towards defining this new urgently needed paradigm. It took a few years, but this process resulted in what is known in Canada as the White Horse Mining Initiative in 1994, which constitute a landmark in Canada's contribution to the development of national and international standards for social responsibility and responsible investment. I invite you to consult Dr. Google about the process and its result at www.nrcan, uh, National Resource or uh, Natural Resource Canada, nrcan.gc.ca, as perhaps this may constitute a source of inspiration. The debates that a company plans to develop any natural resources projects in many countries nowadays cannot be resolved once and for all by decree, by a hurriedly elaborated public policy, or by a licensing process. Such debates cannot be avoided and should not be avoided, but all efforts should be deployed for them to take place in meeting rooms and not in the street. 
in order to recuperate its, the, its useful element within an institutional framework of one kind or another. Round tables, observatories, local development agencies, local round tables, regular information sessions or permanent information centers, and last but not least, grievance mechanisms, local or national, should be contemplated as a menu of possible options with a view to creating those opportunities for interactions between the different categories of stakeholders, for myths to different categories of stakeholders. For, to avoid myths to develop or for conflicts to graduate into violent ones. This is the so-called, or this is stakeholder engagement at, at its purest. Coming back to the grievance mechanism, let me dwell on this element for a few seconds. Such processes are, are essential elements of this model and of any other models, as confirmed by the WEF process, which we mentioned earlier, and a lot of other literature. They should occur at the various levels of the state, national, and regional, including at the project level. Greece has within its laws such processes already, and I'm sure that companies are interested in looking into existing models elsewhere in the world to set up such a useful tool at the project level. Conclusions. Greece has within its reach a great opportunity to translate the various energies that I sense in this room into durable development outcomes and outputs. Let's invest our energies, our time and effort into this transformation exercise, defining our common values, establishing the appropriate institutions to foster dialogue, ensure coordination and oversight, allowing for effective partnerships to emerge and grow, therefore ensuring that true, genuine, sustainable, and durable outputs and outcomes are the final resort. When we will all, cons four, three, when we all consider that Mr. Papagiorgio's intervention this morning is a positive step in the right direction, we will be on the right track. As we witnessed earlier, Obviously, there are a lot of conversation that have not taken place as yet. Finally, a union member and worker at one of the projects I recently visited in northern Greece looked at me in the eyes and said, don't make immigrants out of us. Mi cante metanastes apomas. Ευχαριστώ. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την ευκαιρία και για την υπομονή σας. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ τον κύριο Γκέι, επειδή έχουμε περάσει λίγο το χρόνο μας. Θα προχωρήσουμε αμέσως στην επόμενη... Ε... Κάποια ερώτηση... Α, παρακαλώ. <laughs> Εντάξει, πώς δεν υπάρχει ερώτηση. Ναι. Επειδή ε, έχουμε λι... ακόμα άλλη μία ομιλία και έχουμε και το θέμα των τοπικών κοινωνιών αργότερα, μήπως μπορούμε να κρατήσουμε και Παπαγιουργίου τις ερωτήσεις μας αργότερα, αν είναι δυνατόν. <laughs> αν είναι δυνατόν. <laughs> Εκτός αν υπάρχει μία συγκεκριμένη ερώτηση από τον κύριο Πρέσβη, έτσι μια σύντομη... <laughs> ναι, βεβαίως, κάντε τα. Βεβαίως. Μόνο ναι. σας παρακαλώ θερμά, λίγο σύντομα. Ναι. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ο κύριος Πρέσβης είπε ότι ο Καναδάς έχει μια έκταση 10 εκατομμυρίων τετραγωνικών χιλιόμετρων. Η Ελλάδα έχει μια έκταση 130.000 τετραγωνικών χιλιόμετρων. Δηλαδή ο Καναδάς είναι 800 φορές μεγαλύτερος από την Ελλάδα. Εάν λοιπόν λέγαμε ότι η Ελλάδα εξόρισε 800 φορές λιγότερα ορυκτά από τον Καναδά θα είχαμε κάποια ισορροπία. Επιπλέον, και με καταλαβαίνετε, τα λέω πολύ αργά και ξέρω ότι με καταλαβαίνετε, η μέση απόσταση του χώρου εξόρυξης στην Ελλάδα από τη θάλασσα είναι 10 χιλιόμετρα. 
Η μέση θερμοκρασία στην Ελλάδα είναι 18 βαθμοί. Η μέση βροχόπτωση είναι 600 χιλιοστά. Και η Ελλάδα είναι πρώτη στη ζώνη ερημοποίησης. Κύριε Παπαγιοργή, Τι θα συστήνατε εσείς εάν η Ελλάδα ήταν η πατρίδα σας. Μισό λεπτό, μισό λεπτό αν έχετε την καλοσύνη. Αφήστε να απαντήσει ο κύριος. Αν έχετε την καλοσύνη. Σας παρακαλώ πάρα πολύ. Βέβαια. Βέβαια. Και βέβαια. Uh, this is why I'm encouraging that everyone gets together so that everyone can find ways of doing this um, in the best possible way. It's, it is not because we are 10 million square kilometers that the problems that, that we confront are different than yours. And we had to resort to, uh, logically, to putting everybody at the same table. Uh, it, it doesn't matter whether your country is 10 million or 1 million or even uh, 500,000 square kilometers if the, the mine is going to affect you. It doesn't matter where you, it's the size of the country. And uh, we have mines uh, underneath cities. We have mines uh, uh, we have mines next to villages. Uh, we have villages next to mines because, uh, you know, both happen. Um, uh, and um, uh, we have found ways, and I can't say that we have 100% 100, uh, 100 success on all projects. This would be a lie. But we have a very high uh, rate of success of engagement with the communities with a view to ensure that the communities gets uh, compensated when it requires to be compensated uh, and that the benefits that flow from the mining um, activities are, are equitably uh, uh, distributed amongst the three families of stakeholders. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very Πρόλαβε ο κύριος Παπαγεωργίου, θα έλεγα και αυτό, αλλά έκανα γρήγορα ένα υπολογισμό εδώ και είδα ότι η Αυστραλία, η Αυστραλία είναι 7.687.000 εκατομμύρια, χιλιόμετρα, χιλιόμετρα, τετραγωνικά χιλιόμετρα, των οποίων το 20% είναι έτοιμο. Η Gibson Desert είναι 155.000 χιλιόμετρα. Η Great Sandy Desert είναι 400.000 χιλιόμετρα. Την ερώτησή σας, παρακαλώ πολύ. Λοιπόν, Ξέρουν τι είναι. Δυόμετρα, λοιπόν, συγκρίνεται, κάνετε, είναι ατυχή η σύγκριση, κυρία Μπασαντρίσου. Σας Ας ευχαριστώ πολύ. Σας Ασφαλία, ευχαριστώ πολύ. Το οποίο το 6% είναι έρημος. Αν έχετε ε, την καλοσύνη, χαμηλώστε τον τόνο. Με την αρχαρχή καθήκη, η οποία πάρα είναι το... Πάρτε το, είναι της, το, το περιβόλι της Παναγίας και κάνετε σύγκριση. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ, κύριε. Οποία πήρατε εσεί οι Αυστραλοί από του κακομίδε, του Αμπορίζινη και θέλετε να μετατρέψετε και του Έλληνε σε Αμπορίζινη. Σα ευχαριστώ πολύ. Σα ευχαριστώ πολύ. Δεν αναφερθήκατε, με ευχαριστώ πολύ για, το, για την παρατήρηση, δεν αναφερθήκατε στο γεγονός ότι και οι δύο ε, αναφέραμε από την εμπειρία Αυστραλία και Καναδά, ότι οι, οι ε, εταιρείε μας δραστηριοποιούνται σε όλο τον κόσμο. Δεν μιλάμε μόνο για τις, ε, για τις ε, δραστηριότητες στη δική μας τη χώρα. Κυρία μου, σας παρακαλώ πάρα πολύ, μην διακόπτετε την πράσβη. Δεν έχει καμία σημασία. Είναι θέμα συνεργασίας. Είναι, είναι ένα τομέα που δεν μπορούμε να αγνοήσουμε. Δεν μπορούμε να αγνοήσουμε. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω πάρα πολύ θερμά τον κύριο Κανατσούλη που έτσι συντόνισε αυτή την, αυτή την ομάδα ομιλητών. Την κυρία Πρέσβη, την κυρία Μπλουμφιλντ, τον κύριο Πέκ, τον Πρέσβη και τον κύριο Γκέ για την παρουσία τους. Και σας παρακαλώ πάρα πολύ να τους ευχαριστήσουμε θερμά για την παρουσία της ευχαριστήσεις. Πριν να προχωρήσουμε στην επόμενη ενότητα, που είναι και εξαιρετικά σημαντική και θέλω να παρακαλέσω όλους μας να μπορέσουμε να την κάνουμε με όσο πιο ήρεμο τρόπο γίνεται, θέλω να καλέσω στο βήμα και τον κύριο Σέπο Μάουλα, 
ο οποίος είναι ο πρώην δήμαρχος ε, ε, της πόλης Κίτιλα από τη Φιλανδία. Είναι μια πόλη η οποία βρίσκεται πέρα από τον Αρκτικό κύκλο και ο οποίος έχει την καλοσύνη να μας επισκεφθεί ε, στην Αθήνα για να μας δώσει λίγο τις γνώσεις του. Ο κύριος ε, Μάουλα ήταν για πέντε χρόνια γενικός γραμματέας στην περιφερειακή κυβέρνηση του Λαπλάντ και δήμαρχος στα Κίτιλα για 16 ολόκληρα χρόνια. Ε, θέλω να σας παρακαλέσω, επειδή ταξίδεψε πάρα πολύ μακριά, να τον καλωσορίσουμε στο βήμα. Κύριε Μάουλα, please. That is okay. Oh, fine. I'm coming from Kittila, municipality from Lapland, almost 6,000 kilometers, and, and I must have something to tell you. <laughs> is it so? And if I say that yesterday morning when I started from Kittila, it was minus 29 degrees frost, one meter snow, but sun is shining and in high season in tourism. We have there more than 20,000 tourists nowadays. And most of them are from abroad. We are making uh, tourism industry as we are making a mining industry in Gittila municipality. But the first, I must tell you one joke. Former, my job was, I was mayor, was mayor in Kittila municipality for 16 years. And many, many people, especially from abroad, asked me, how can you afford here? You have almost 50 degrees frost in winter times. You have more than one meter snow. In summertime, there's only 20 degrees warm and a lot of mosquitoes. I told them, in summertime, we fish and make love. How is it in wintertime? Then we don't fish. Okay. Here is Kittila and it is very far away. And uh, as I told you, I was 16 years mayor in, in municipality and I have I was very lucky man because I was the only one and the first one mayors in Finland who had honor to open a real new gold mine. And <clears throat> I must tell you history, perhaps you understand better if what, what I say. But in the beginning of the 19th, the unemployment was about 30 per uh, percent. Our tourist, in the tourist industry was increasing, but offering only 7,000 beds. And incomings was not enough for uh, taking unemployment rate, uh, rate lower. Agriculture and forest industry were decreasing as in whole Lapland and whole Finland. Population was declining and especially the problem was big that the young ones wanted to leave our municipality, our area and also our region. Perhaps it's the same story for you. 
and in many countries where we were, we were undeveloped areas. And our image was missing, it was going down. And of course, the economy of region, of people, of municipality was going down. Something new. <laughs> or oh, we are living in these days, same. And the developing of, of our mind. The Surikosi gold deposit was found in 1986. It's very young deposit. And the exploration advanced very rapidly. It was a Swedish firm who started this developing and the big uh, amount was in, in this, was the owned by Finnish State Geological Survey Institute. It has worked years and years and many, many, many years to find something new. And we wondered why are there mines in the Swedish side? Why are there mines in, in, in the Russian side? What's the reason that we have no mines here? And uh, by, the, by the way, I heard in the day news that Finland is the first country in the world for invest in mining while protecting free, uh, uh, while protecting the environment. It was Fraser Institute, and now must, I, I must say that the Swedish were second. We have a little in with Swedish people. And so, after the exploration, the authorities of the Kittila municipality and, and the other people in, around this mining area were informed what is happening. It was a Swedish firm who, who informed them. There were a lot of negotiations with the municipality. Many of, of the members of our, our parliament were against what is happening, what is happening with our nature with our fishing, with our hunting, with our reindeers, and so on. But the most important question was, we must have bread today and tomorrow and earn, earn the bread every day. We must do something. The municipality and the mining company joined forces and negotiated with the state of authorities of state of Finland. And that was a very big step because we combined our power. And we made the cooperation with European Union uh, project. I wonder why have I hadn't heard nothing about your projects if you want to use European Union money. Because in Finland, it's quite usual. We make projects, European Union pays even 70%. It's a possibility. And after it, you can build infrastructure and so on with your European Union money, especially in these days. Perhaps I understand good, but I heard no no speaking about it. And it in, contains employers training and educating because I have.